Good afternoon. Um, I had to uh, cancel my taxi just now. <laughs> and I believe I've got 11 minutes as well to give my talk. <laughs> and I'm so glad that so many of you remained. There's still 200 left, but the ones that have remained, I hope to make it worth your while. Have you had a good day today? Yes. What an amazing ch talk by... Um, sorry? I thought I heard someone say something. Um, what an amazing talk by James. Fantastic. I'm afraid it's downhill from here. <laughs> um, I'm going to be very brief because I know we probably have stuff to do, so I'm going to quickly uh, talk about what I'm going to be talking about, which is urban birds and my involvement with urban birds and urban wildlife and with people as well, and hopefully um, maybe inspire one of the two of you who haven't tried before to actually get involved in looking up and seeing what's around us. So, let me quickly tell you about my history. Um, I've been birding, in fact, I was a twitcher in the womb, and I've been birding a long time. I can't remember a moment that I didn't actually notice natural history. And, um, in fact, it started off with invertebrates, and I noticed that the invertebrates were feed, being fed on by birds, and I didn't know what the birds were. I had no one around me who shared my interest. I was born in northwest London, um, in an area which was a uh, field of immigrants, um, West Indian and Irish, and no one around me, even my family, had an interest. Um, so I taught myself. My mother was really great because she fed my interest with books, and I began to realise what birds were. But it wasn't until I was seven years old when I walked into the library and found this book, Birds of Britain, Europe, Middle East, with North Africa, and it was like finding the Holy Scriptures, basically 100, well, 1,200 species or what have you, and I couldn't believe it. So I learnt everything about all the species of that region, and by the age of eight, I was a veritable walking encyclopedia on birds, particularly of that region. And then, when I was about eight, at the same library I found birds of town and suburb, which, in fact, turned out to be my first ever urban birding manual. Um, I found it difficult to read as an eight-year-old. I read it a few times since then. I can understand it now. But the uh, author, a guy called Eric Sims, um, he was a prolific writer. He was a broadcaster and a sound recordist for the BBC. He wrote a ton of books. But this was the one that really turned me into what I've you know, become today, even though I didn't realize at the time that I was an urban birder. Indeed, I was told many times over that um, you can only find wildlife if you go into the countryside. And living in London, I didn't have that opportunity because no one would take me. So in the end, I looked around me, and that's when I realised, actually, there's a lot of stuff to be seen. So I became an urban birder. So what I'd like to do in the next 10 minutes of my talk, before we close tonight, um, is to take you around some of the places I've been in the world um, in search of urban birds. There is one location where I've kind of cheated a bit, but hopefully by that point you'll be so involved and enraptured that you won't even notice. <laughs> so, firstly, there's no better place to start than home, London. Um, that's where I was born, as I said before, and I spent most of my formative years. Um, I'm probably best well known uh, for Wormwood Scrubs, my local patch, not the prison, by the way. I've had all the jokes about looking for jailbirds and things like that. Um, but I want to talk about another project that I, was, I actually uh, started, which was the uh, Tower 42 Bird Study Group. Um, there was this building in central London. I don't know if you can see because it's quite bright here. I like normally to be quite romantic and dark in here, but it's a bit... Anyway, um, this building called... Um, well, it's Tower 42. In the past, it was called the Nat West Building. And um, it was, at that point, when I first got there, one of the tallest, if not the tallest, building in London. It was over 600 feet tall and had an amazing vista from the rooftop. Um, I heard about it uh, because I was playing football one day and I tackled someone quite badly. And instead of fighting, we actually had a conversation. It turned out he was a cameraman and had been filming on there. And I've always wanted to go on top of a tall building um, to watch, funny enough, the migrations of wood pigeon over southeast England that occurs for a very short window between mid-October 
and early November. I don't know how many of you know about this, but it's incredible. Some uh, autumnal mornings, I'd go to Wormer Scrubs, look up in the sky, and you see this beautiful blue sky, and then these things just twinkling in the sky, the pigeons with beautiful silvery underwings. They're so gorgeous. And I remember one morning counting or guesstimating around about 45,000 in an hour and a half, flying from the northeast heading southwest. So I wanted to get up on a roof to actually explore that and watch this. So I managed to chat the, uh, the management up and get onto the roof to do that. But then I realized, actually, this is all about looking up. So I got together a group of people and decided that we will do a survey. We'll monitor the birds of prey flying over London. And I remember the media at the time saying, birds of prey over London, are you joking? But it got people looking. And it's quite interesting because up on that roof, we saw a hell of a lot over the nine years. I think there's one or two people in here, Carol, I can see noddle, nodding, shall I say, who was on the roof with me occasionally. We saw a hell of a lot of different species of birds up there. We've, you know, we saw the classic peregrines. We saw at least six territories. I remember the most memorable moment with the peregrines was watching a peregrine take out a pigeon in front of us. Imagine, there's no buildings obscuring, so we saw the whole thing. It took the pigeon out in front of us and it flew off to Tower Bridge, landed on Tower Bridge to have its lunch. What a great location. <laughs> um, but we had all sorts, peregrines, we had uh, kestrels, but we also had some real oddities. I remember one day, hen harrier, male hen harrier, flew across London. You know, it's incredible. But one morning, we got up there, and uh, this is the actual bird, a, he a honey buzzard flew over from the southeast. We saw it from Peckham, flying over Peckham, and normally that makes people laugh because Peckham birds. Anyway, <laughs> um, it flew over from Peckham, heading, uh, heading north. But then we saw a second bird, and this bird was flying a bit lower, and it kind of circled round in front of us, not quite in front of us, but we could see it circling round, and it landed somewhere where we thought was Battersea. So we thought it was in a park, you know, just landing. But in reality, it had flown, and if you can imagine the other side of the scene now, there's a guy standing in his office having a cup of tea, seeing this bird flying towards him, and it kept coming and coming and coming, all of a sudden, it hit the window and landed on the, on the shelf of roof in front of him. He had the presence of mind to take a picture of it, and it turned out to be a honey buzzard, and the happy ending is that it shook itself off, and 10 minutes later it flew off and headed north. But isn't that amazing? It shows you what kind of things fly above our heads, and we never notice, even birders. You know, we need to be looking up the whole time because birds have wings and will fly. I remember when I was a kid, I thought that birds, when they migrated, first they only migrated from the 1st of September to the 31st, nothing before or after, and also they flew around cities. But in reality, they follow ancient lines, and it doesn't matter what's beneath them, they will still, <coughs> still follow those routes. And flying over cities like London, they see green patches, blue patches, and although they are encircled by buildings and humanity and what have you, they will come down. And often you'll find more birds, especially on migration, in your local park than you would do if you were in the middle of Norfolk or somewhere else quite rural, because the habitats are quite condensed. So, London was a great learning ground for me, but I've been very lucky since being... Um, the urban birder. I was born 16 years ago. <laughs> so a bit younger than Keith. <laughs> and by the way, I like your new name, Keith. That uh, Chris is... Uh, oh, I like your T-shirt too, but uh, uh, Keith Bitten is quite a nice name, definitely. <laughs> um, I've been lucky enough to cross a lot of rivers and see a lot of land um, in the 16 years. I can't believe... I mean, I never before then thought I'd even, you know, go as far as Scotland, let alone the places I've been to. But recently, I am, um, and when I say recently, literally last week, I went to Malta. Um, now, I know there's a few groans when I mention Malta. Um, for those who don't know the geography, that's where it is. Well, that's what it is, even, with the island of Gozo above it. And I went there, um, not uh, initially to go birding, but to be a member or participant of the British Guild of Travel Writers, because I'm deemed as a travel writer. 
So I went to the event, and it was all about gastronomy. It was all about hanging out, looking at all the you know the, the wonderful buildings and stuff in the uh, in in Malta. But I did notice that there wasn't much in the way of birds going on, apart from multitudes of Spanish sparrows. Well, actually, there's a bit of an argument going on because even though this looks like a Spanish sparrow in Malta, there's a few that look like Italian sparrows, which are not quite as black and streaky black as uh, the Spanish sparrow. And now they're trying to say it could be possibly another species called the Maltese sparrow, which is up there with the Maltese falcon. <laughs> um, so there wasn't too much going on apart from the sparrows and the um, pigeons. But yeah, we had a look round and um, we saw the variety of different things in terms of uh, the landscape, but we also saw Malta's national bird, which is the blue rock thrush. I never knew that Malta had a national bird, and I since found out that the hunters actually spare it. Well, when they first start hunting, they have to kill one to have one in their, in their living room, and then they spare it, which is quite shocking. But as I said, the scenery, you walk around, you're looking at this wonderful scenery, and if you came on holiday with your family and you knew nothing about Malta's history or you know, how the wildlife crime is there, you'd think it's a nice place to be. And in fact, it looks nice, and it's actually a good place in terms of migration. And you're walking around and you're hearing the sounds of quail everywhere, and you, you hear lots of finches calling, and you hear, when you're by the coast, the sounds of golden plovers. But then you think, hang on a minute, that doesn't quite sound right. And then you look again, and you realise that these wonderful little things that you thought were ruins of sheds or you know, little places for farms are in fact the huts from which the trappers operate. And you look further and you notice that there's areas of land that's been sort of cleared in sort of rectangular shapes. They're the areas where the trappers lay their claptraps and they sit in their huts and they pull a string basically to, to, uh, to clap the trap to, to capture the birds. And I was basically seeing all this stuff. And then when the conference finished, I stayed on for three or four days to hang out with my friends with BirdLife Malta. And that's when I really got depressed because I was walking around and I, I noticed, for example, these tins hanging from trees. And I was wondering, you know, what's that there for? And it turns out that the hunters, um, they sort of wring the, uh, the, 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 the cans, scale the birds out of the trees and then basically kill them. And I just didn't understand the mentality. Um, I, I, don't, I mean, I'm not, this talk's not about Malta, by the way. I just thought I'd just throw it in there. But I was really... Actually, Malta's quite an urban island. It's very, very, you know, built upon now. So it's very urban. And I won't depress you anymore with the hunting thing, but it really made me down. But it was good to see some birds there. I mean, the Sardinian warblers were all over the place, which is really nice to see. Um, and also... I was seeing the first of the northern wheat ears coming through. Um, and I also visited a couple of nature reserves, um, and also yeah, meadow pipits around, but also visited a couple of na uh, nature reserves and saw a variety of different birds, including um, common sandpipers and uh, these lovely black-headed uh, wagtails, uh, feldegi they're called, um, the black-headed race of yellow wagtails. And I was a bit worried because you're sitting in these nature reserves and watching these wonderful birds. And by the way, there's only two or three nature reserves and they're absolutely tiny. And you know that the moment they step out of this nature reserve, you know, they've got to take their lives into their own hands, which was quite scary. The previous bird was an eastern subalpine warbler. This is a spectacle warbler, which was fantastic to see. I didn't realise that uh, Malta had a resident population, although it's very scarce. I did manage to find a few migrants as well, including a few red-throated pipits, which were really nice. But I think the most poignant moment was when I went for a walk during the conference I was at. I walked along from the hotel up the beach to try and see what birds I could see. This is right in the very beginning of my stay in Malta. And I saw maybe 11 species. It took me two hours to see 11 species, which when you think of a Mediterranean area, that's not much and not many individuals of, many of, of those species. And perhaps the, the most surprising bird was a stone curlew that I saw flying past. 
And I remember telling the uh, Maltese, uh, RS, um, sorry, the BirdLife um, International people at Mal for Malta about this bird, and they said, that's really great, but normally, you know, it's a very scarce migrant here, but normally our records are of birds that have been shot or trapped. And I thought, Jesus, I mean, how, long, how much longer will that one survive? There are hunting seasons, but it doesn't really apply for them. And also, when you think that in that, an island of 500,000 people, there's over 10,000 hunters, there's over 4,000 trappers, and both actually don't really like each other in many respects. I thought they were all one and the same, but apparently not. And only 20 hardcore birders. Um, and the birders um, form a WhatsApp group, members only, invitation only, so that the trappers and the hunters don't hear about rarities because they are very good birders. Because on the last day I went sea watching and the guy I was with said to me, don't talk about hunting here. And I said, why? He said, there's two people here who are hunters. But I said, everyone's got binoculars and cameras. And he said, yes, but when the hunting season starts, the camera's swapped out for a gun. And I'm thinking, what kind of mentality is that? To me, it's like, the only way I can describe it is the evil twin of a birder, basically. You know, they go out to enjoy nature, but instead of watching, they shoot. Anyway, let's get onto nicer things. <laughs> I do not live in England anymore. I hang out in England, but my main place that I, I am now is in Spain, and I live in a region called Extremadura, which I think many of you know, some of you don't. Extremadura is kind of in this area here, and if I can just zoom in a little bit, where the red line is, demarks or denotes where Extremadura is. It's um, in southwest Spain, it's southeast, no, southwest of Madrid, and northwest of Seville, so it's kind of in the middle, and it borders um, uh, Portugal, and it's basically twice the size of Wales, or the size of Switzerland, or if you're from America, it's just under the size of Kentucky, so it's huge, but it's less, well, actually just over one million people there, so it's really quite rural. It's one of the most rural places in Western Europe. And aside from the birds, I mean, it's such a beautiful place in terms of the scenery. This is Trujillo, which I'm sure many of you who've been to Extremadura will know. But there's lots of these hidden spots all over the place, castles that you can visit where you can go any time of year and there's no one there. It's just incredible. You know, you come to England or Wales or Scotland and there's a queue to get in and there's, what, you know, there's, there's places where you can't go within the ruins. In Spain, or at least in Extremadura, you can go practically anywhere. And I often visit these ruins because they're great spots for birding as well. But most people think of Extremadura as being this barren area in the summer, you know, very blonde and not much life. And yes, part of it is like that, but, well, actually, when I say not much, not much life, there's plenty of life, but it looks blonde, burnt, you know. But during the summer, it gets really warm, up to 44 degrees sometimes, so it's pretty hot. But there's also lots of other habitats. There's mountains, there's rivers, there's woodlands, there's areas what they call as the dehaces, which is where you get um, these oak trees, home oak, and I always forget the other species of oak, and the uh, Extremadurans or Extremanians or whatever they call themselves, um, they uh, have their pigs, their, their black pigs that they allow to roam free, and these pigs provide some of the best um, pork in the world, really, because they're fed on acorns, they eat their own acorns. Um, but there's also lots of you know, areas of just, it's just beautiful. I mean, most of the areas actually in the farmland areas have been abandoned. I mean, you can see this building's been abandoned and the history isn't so nice when you think about it because it does hark back to Franco's days. But anyway, I'm talking about where I come from, come from, where I lived, <laughs> um, a city called Merida, which is in the kind of middle of Extremadura. It's a city which has a population of around about 60,000. So city is not a good name, it's more of a huge village. Nothing ever changes, it's really quiet. And I, in, I've been living in Extremadura for seven years, but prior to 
the pandemic, I was basically just laying my hat there and then traveling elsewhere. And I was in Spain when the lockdown was announced and it was pretty draconian. And I, I thought I'd just go back to my apartment in Merida. Two weeks later, I'd be out again doing my thing. I was there for a year. And the first three months of the lockdown were, as I say, draconian. We weren't allowed out apart from getting food from the supermarket. So I had no exercise for three months. So when I actually got out, I began to learn more about the city. And when I walk around the area, there's lots of places where I can find loads of wildlife, literally a few hundred yards from my house. So this area here, for example, it may look half concrete on the, uh, that side of the, of the picture, but the rough area of grass is actually marshy grass, and there's a, 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 a brook there. And in that area, I remember when I first came out of lockdown, the first day I walked to this place and I was hearing nightingales and chetis warblers and reed warblers and great reed warblers and then hearing quail and sea montagues. I mean, it was just amazing just to be in this area and seeing all these great birds just around the corner. But Merida, I suppose, is most famous for the Roman bridge. And this bridge is imaginatively called the Roman Bridge. It's the longest and oldest uh, Roman bridge still in existence in the world. It's over a kilometre long. And it's one of the best places in the entire region for birding because you can walk 30 metres in 30 minutes and hear and see 30 species. I mean, it's incredible. Penduline tits, little bittern, glossy ibis, um, Western Swamp Hen, I mean, I, the list goes on, and underneath the bridge also nests various birds, including, well, nearby the bridge, including um, kingfishers. And many tours come and visit this bridge. I mean, I bring tours myself um, to the bridge. But when I was living in Merida, I actually um, had this area as my patch, and I'd walk along the river. The bridge spans a, a river called the Guadiana, and the Guadiana basically empties out in the Atlantic, so it's a very long river. But in that patch, or the patch where I'm uh, talking to you about now, it's so rich with uh, wildlife. So I walk along the patch. Um, I used to do it you know, every day when I was in this sort of incarceration period and see loads of different things. I remember one time, though, I did 12 visits in one year just to hear 12 visits, and I, in 12 visits, saw 120 different species, which is incredible when you think that I spent 25 years in the scrubs, not the prison, <laughs> and saw 150 in 25 years. So it shows you how rich this area is. And I'm not going to give you a list of birds because it's just too exhaustive and, you know, you're going to be hearing loads of names. I just want to show you just how wonderful this local urban area is um, for me, it was paradise just to, to walk up and down and stand here and watch, um, you know, purple herons and, and other such species. Um, one of the classic birds that I saw uh, and still see and will always see, hopefully, in the city is spotless starlings, or our spotless starlings, very similar to our starling, but looking a lot sort of oilier looking, slightly bigger, um, and the song is a bit more simple. Uh, they are common residents. Um, in the summer, or should I say in the winter, they are joined in the sort of countryside areas, in the grassland areas, by common starlings. And you'd expect common starlings to be hanging out in the towns. But in fact, they're very rural and they don't number much. It's mostly the spotless starlings that we get. And I remember when I was in uh, lockdown, being on my terrace and watching uh, the whole life history or breeding history of one particular pair of uh, spotless starlings I watched the male singing and trying to attract several mates. I actually watched him meet his girlfriend, who later became his wife. You know, I watched him get her ready to lay eggs. There's, there's kids here. And then I watched the kids come. You know, it's great to see that whole cycle of life. Um, also common in the area, um, in the city, in fact, around the whole of Extra Medjuda, is Europe's smallest finch, the uh, European serin, which is, if you think a sparrow, it's about a third of the size of a sparrow, and they're singing everywhere, such beautiful birds. For me, summer is, is noted 
by the, uh, the sound of, and the sight, of course, of bee eaters, some of which, or some of whom, actually nested within the city as well. There are a couple of areas where people have started building housing estates and then left it after the credit crunch occurred, so they were just deserted, and the birds were actually nesting in the embankments created by the building, or the lack of building. And then, of course, the classic Iberian magpie, which is an endemic to that part of the world, Iberia. Well, certainly the Mediterranean basin, which is here. <laughs> and um, they are, well, actually not, well, in Merida, they are quite shy, but in the city I live in now, which is about an hour north, called Catharus, which is a, a medieval city, um, they are common and hang out in the parks, which are pretty good. Um, someone earlier had pictures of pallid swifts. Um, this is my attempt. They're very hard to get pictures of, but pallid swifts, um, along with common swift and alpine swifts, are birds that see all the time in the city. And where I live now in Catharus, um, I've got them nesting across the road from me because I can watch them from my flat as they enter their nests. And they come during the... Um, in fact, they come pretty early in February and they hang out until... October, even into November. We also have uh, a huge amount of house martins nesting in Merida. I remember when I first turned up in Merida, I, um, this was about 12 years ago, I was walking down the street and I looked up and I saw two sides of, a, of a, an apartment block and I counted around about 200 nests on two sides of one building. And funny enough, a year later, the London Wildlife Trust did a survey of house martin nests in the whole of Greater London, and they found just under 200 in the whole of Greater London. And there was 202 sides of one building. Um, however, they're not, even though they're common, they're not necessarily honoured, um, because I've seen evidence of people knocking down nests during breeding season. And I've also, when I moved into my apartment in Merida, um, the landlord had had um, some CDs hung up in the corner where the house martins would have nest, nested. And I said to him, if you don't let the house martins nest, I ain't moving in. I took a risk, <laughs> but he let me move in, so that was good. So in the end, I had up to three pairs of house martins nesting, which was nice. Um, Chetty's warbler is another bird, very common um, in Merida, along the river. You hear them everywhere. And for some reason, you get to see them a bit easier than you would do in the UK. I always get fairly good views of, of them. And of course, um, another predatory bird um, is the uh, Iberian grey shrike, which is a very common bird around the whole of uh, Extremadura and also within the city limits. And speaking of predatory birds, of course, there are a lot of predatory birds. What, what, what I love about Extremadura is the fact that you can look up and there's always a bird of prey in the sky, always. I think there's 22 different species of bird of prey actually nesting in the region. It's incredible, but there's always something in the sky to look at. This is a black kite, and black kites are now coming in. In fact, they've already probably already come in now, and they're getting ready to breed. In the winter, they are replaced, because they migrate to, to Africa, they're replaced by red kites. A lot of the red kites that come to the region actually come from um, Nordic countries and Germany and sort of Poland, that area. What's interesting is the population of red kites in Spain, and certainly in Extremadura, has fallen through the floor. In Extremadura, an area that's sized, uh, twice the size of Wales, there's less or just above 100 pairs in the whole region. So um, what's happening now is that the birds that were successfully introduced into Oxfordshire all those years ago and now all over the place, including probably one we just saw earlier when we were outside. Um, obviously, it's one of the most, if not the most successful reintroduction schemes in the world. Some of those birds have now been taken back to Spain to be reintroduced because those birds actually came from Spain originally. So it's, it's interesting to see the whole cycle start again. I've been following this story for a future BBC Wildlife magazine article. Um, sticking on the uh, subject of raptors, this is one of the most glorious as far as I'm concerned. This is the griffin vulture. Um, 
in Extremadura, I don't think there's anywhere else in Spain or elsewhere where you'll see so many. There's around about nearly 5,000 pairs now. Um, so you cannot fail, you cannot fail to see a griffin vulture. Even in the middle of a city, just look up and you'll see something floating over and it's a griffin vulture. Um, it's amazing how successful they've been. But even more successful is its cousin in many respects because the black vulture, which is the Western Palearctic's biggest raptor, and to see one on the ground, you often think it's a sheep. They're so big, they're really huge. Um, the black vulture, or the monk vulture, or the cinereus vulture, um, has a dis discontinuous uh, range from Iberia all the way over until you get to, um, it begins with M, um, which one? Mongolia. Mongolia, thank you, you're awake, I'm glad. <laughs> that was a ploy, by the way, just to make sure that everyone... <laughs> All the way to Mongolia, but uh, you will never see more than you would do in, in next to Majuda. There's nearly or over 900 pairs of black vulture, and you see them, you know, if you see 10 griffins, you'll see at least two black vultures amongst them. And I've now found a spot, it's a landfill site, right next to the city in Merida, where you can go and see 30 or 40 black vultures, and often really, really low down, so you can take good shots of them as they fly over. So it's an amazing bird to be seen. But my favorite raptor in um, Extremadura is this guy. Um, you say, you know, James said that the northern goshawk is a, is a badass. This guy, I think, is even a bigger bad boy. <laughs> um, this is a Bonelli's eagle. And they are kind of local. They're not common, but they're local. And they're normal prey are rabbits, but this thing will attack anything. Um, they're feared by everything. And my friends in Tarifa, near Gibraltar, tell me that they see juveniles migrating to Africa, and when they come through, they'll take down adult golden eagles and eat them. And this bird is a third smaller than a golden eagle. These guys are not to be messed with. If you come back as a bird, don't hang out near them. So Merida is my spot um, for, for birding. I love walking along the river and you know, seeing what I can see. And nearby, for example, we've got several breeding pairs of marsh harriers, um, a common bird in the actual region. Um, I love actually watching them flying around. And on top of that, we've got plenty of cattle egrets, which of course now have made their debut in the UK. I've actually only ever seen cattle egret twice in the UK. Um, the first time I remember I dipped in them terribly. It was a flock of, I think, eight or nine in Stockers Lake in Hertfordshire back in the 90s or early 2000s. And I dipped thinking I'll never see them. And there you go, they're all over the place now. Um, for me, the main sort of event when you come to Merida and you stand on that bridge is to look for the Western Swamp Hen. And I remember when I first went to that bridge and was looking for the Western Swamp Hen for the first time, I kept on seeing more hens and saying, that's one there! And then suddenly this monster steps out with massive feet. It's like a moor hen on steroids. <laughs> it steps out and you think, oh, that's a Western Swamp Hen. And then you never make that mistake again because they are absolutely amazing to watch. And they kind of slip in and out of cover with equal ease. They're not particularly shy, but, you know, when they fancy, they just walk into cover and you don't see them. So you just got to keep an eye out and you'll be lucky. To see, you, you will get lucky without a doubt. Um, as I said earlier, uh, another bird to be found along that river is the little bittern. Night herons are, you know, often to be seen, particularly um, towards the end of the day um, or the beginning of the day when they're flying back to their roosts. And another bird that's become very successful, not only there, but here as well or becoming that way, is the glossy ibis. I see far more glossy ibis than I ever had before. So that is Extra Madura, my urban birding in Extra Madura in two seconds. You've got to come out if you haven't been before, okay? And I'd love to, talk, to show you around, so uh, give me a shout if you ever fancy it. Now, for the last part of my talk, I'm going to go on a trip to an island called Tobago, 
I was there a few weeks ago, and not quite urban burning, but you kind of give me a bit of poetic license now. Um, it's just an opportunity to show you some nice pictures, really. Um, so basically, I went to Tobago. Now, Tobago, just to go back a bit. Oh, actually, it's there, yeah. Tobago, I always thought Tobago was actually part of Trinidad because you kind of say Trinidad and Tobago in the same breath, don't you? But in fact, they're, very t they're two very different islands. Um, t uh, Trinidad used to be part of South America and it split away, whereas Tobago drifted in um, from over there somewhere, from the Greater Antilles, and sort of come, has come to join with Trinidad. And Tobago has a very different avifauna and fauna in many respects to Trinidad. Trinidad, for example, has monkeys like howler monkeys and you know, birds like motmots, several species of motmots and things like that. Whereas Trinidad has a smaller list, doesn't have any monkeys. You know, there's many species that don't show up in Trinidad but are found there. It's really interesting. The, the dynamic of the actual populations of birds. That really fascinated me when I was on the plane looking at the field guide, wondering why these birds don't occur in Tobago when they put, occur in Trinidad. But anyway, um, Trinidad has a beautiful, you know, when you think of golden beaches and jungles and stuff, that's, that's um, sorry, not Trinidad, Tobago, that's, uh, that's what you get. But there's lots of different species. I must quickly run through a couple of species I saw in semi-urban environments. I'm a lover of thrushes, so the spectacle thrush was a new bird for me, and they were quite common everywhere, um, including urban areas. Slightly smaller than our blackbird, but quite different, as you can see with the, uh, the, the, the markings around the eye. But this bird looks like a blackbird. You'd think it's a blackbird. It's a yellow-legged thrush, and it's about a third smaller than a blackbird, slimmer, and really shy. I mean, I managed to get this bird bathing, didn't notice me watching it, but, you know, they're very difficult to actually see very clearly. So it's quite, you know, very much not like a blackbird at all. But then there's the crested oripendula, which is a bird that noisily is found everywhere, including on Trinidad. Now, you're going to have to help me a little bit here because I've got to a point in my life where in the beginning of my life as a birder, I was inventing names for birds, like sparrows were baby birds, and starlings were mummy birds, and blackbirds were daddy birds. And now I've got to that point where I've forgotten the names of birds I've seen in foreign countries, so I now call them as I see them. So I might throw in a few false names, don't worry about it. You know, it's probably a better name than what they're actually called. So this, this is a plain vented pigeon and what's interesting about this bird is that it spread from its natal South America north, and it's now become a fairly common bird in uh, Tobago, and it's even spread as far, as I believe, as Florida, or the tip, southern tip of Florida. And according to the uh, ornithologist I spoke to on the island, it's not actually to do with global warming, as far as he's concerned. Because I noted that certain species were declining in, on the island, especially seed-eating species. And he said to me the reason for that, as far as he was concerned, was the farm, the farmland, the, farm, the, the farming practices on the island uh, maybe 20 years ago was all about really putting down hardcore pesticides that killed everything. So a lot of the seed-eaters died. But then, over the last 15 years, a lot of the farming areas have been left to just grow and scrub over. The farmers have actually left those farms and it's created this new habitat and these birds have actually come in and taken over or at least sort of become more common. In the skies above, um, there are plenty of swallows and this is a Caribbean martin, a very gorgeous bird, um, bigger than our house martin but more like a starling almost in, in its build. This is a tropical kingbird or TK all found throughout urban areas and very common and often seen. I was happy to see this guy though. This is a grey kingbird and I've never seen one of them before so I was pleased to see that. As I was to see the rufous-tailed jacama, which um, was found throughout the island. But interestingly on, on Trinidad there's about I think three or four species of jacama, whereas on Tobago there's only one. So you can't have any problems identifying birds because there's only one species. Um, and in the woodlands, sometimes I found um, southern lapwings as well, which you don't expect to find in woods. I normally see or think of them 
on areas similar to what we see our northern lapwings. Um, I took a couple of trips by boat to northern or from northern Tobago into two islands. One's called Little Tobago and the other one's called um, Little Tobago and St Giles Island. And this is on the way to St Giles Island and this particular structure they call London Bridge. <laughs> no idea. But I love watching seabirds, so it was a great spot to, to actually have a look at various things. Um, the Cayenne Tern, which I'm not really sure of what it is. I don't know whether it's a race or subspecies of, of uh, Sandwich Tern or Cabot's Tern, as it's called over there, or complete new species in itself, I don't know. But there's plenty of those flying around. But for me, the main event was seeing the red-billed tropic birds. So beautiful. For those who haven't seen them before, they look like terns, but they're massive. Um, they are related to gannets and pelicans, believe it or not. And they were on Little um, Tobago, and I managed to get close and see one on its nest really quite close to me, which is nice. Um, hunting, or should I say bullying, anything that flies, including the uh, tropic birds, were plenty of magnificent frigate birds. And interestingly, on the island, I noticed... On both sides, birds migrating uh, northwards, and my guide was telling me that all of a sudden, over the last few years, they've become more prolific, and now the colonies on Little Tobago is probably the biggest on the whole or in the whole of the West Indies. And also, being bullied are boobies. These are brown boobies, but there's also red-footed boobies as well. So lots of different seabirds to actually take in and enjoy including brown pelicans. I love brown pelicans, especially when they start that amazing dive into the sea to capture fish. It's amazing, the pelican diving after fish. Um, on land, there were various species that I was enthralled with. I love my hummingbirds. This is a white-necked jacobin. Um, Fantastic-looking thing. This is a black-throated mango. Um, but for me... The killer of all hummers on the island is this. I don't think any picture can actually give it credit. You've got to see it for real. And this is a ruby topaz uh, hummingbird. And in certain lights, it looks like that. But then when it turns its head, it's just brown. You know, it's just incredible to watch. That, to me, should be their national bird. But you'll be surprised when I show you what the national bird actually is. Um, this is the Trinidad Mot Mot. Uh, again, there's only one species of mot mot on Tobago, so you can be happy when you see one because if you're in Trinidad, there's about four to choose from. Um, I was very lucky to see this guy. This is a white tailed nightjar. Unlike our nightjars, they're very shy. I couldn't get very close to it at all. And then I took the picture and basically it flew straight off. But apparently, they're common throughout the island. But one of the most um, charismatic birds in Tobago is this guy. This is the blue-backed mannequin, and it's the one, the species that's made famous by David Attenborough. Don't know if you remember Life of Birds, when they all line up on the, on the branch and they jump, the leapfrog over each other. This is, the, this is the guy. Unfortunately, we didn't see it doing the leapfrogging, but uh, it was great to, to notice it anyway. And let me introduce you, drum roll, Tobago's national bird. What a beauty this guy is. Oh, not this guy, this guy. <laughs> that is Tobago's national bird. I think it's called the pale vented um, chakala, chaka, ch chakalaka. Chakalaka. I always get, <laughs> always get the pronunciation wrong. Chakalaka. So that's the uh, national bird of Tobago. And uh, just going back to water birds, green heron, love seeing them. Yellow uh, crowned night heron, amazing. Um, American purple gallinule, beautiful, um, and also lots of shorebirds or waders as we call them. This, I believe, is a lesser yellow legs. I always get lesser and greater yellow legs mixed up, but I think that's a lesser yellow legs. And I was very happy to watch um, two solitary sandpipers getting together and not being so solitary. So it's all great, but then I realised actually that there's lots of similarities between Tobago and Malta. There's lots of trapping that goes on. And also, there's lots of hunting, including hunting animals 
as game, uh, should I say, um, bushmeat. This is a yellow-footed tortoise. It's a very rare reptile on the island, yet um, especially during festivals that are held several times during the year, these, these guys are hunted out and killed to be, you know, to be cooked during festivals. And similarly, there's another species, an armadillo, a very small armadillo, which is now extremely rare, and it's been found to carry leprosy, yet they still go and try and track it down, hunt it, kill it, and eat it during these festivals. And it is about education, but in some cultures, like in, in, in Tobago and Trinidad, there's this whole thing about, you know, well, there's a voodoo thing, there's a religious thing, you know. These things are very hard. These barriers are very hard to break down. And finally, I just want to tell you about one thing about Toba uh, Tobago, and that is, this is the, uh, I think it's the scarlet rumped agouti. I might be wrong, but it looks good. Good name. Um, it's a rodent, and it's like a small deer, and they look very cute, and they're everywhere. Um, and this was part of the reason why farmers were putting out these pesticides that killed everything because they were prevalent and they were digging up people's, you know, crops. But the problem was, as it always is, it kills part of the, uh, the chain, the chain of life. And it killed off all the ocelot, the cats that lived on the island, that were fed on this, this creature. And also there's a, a bird of prey called the great black hawk, that was decimated, now they're very rare, and that was the one species that was keeping the agoutis in check. But because of all the pesticides, these animals were exterminated and the agoutis just became even more prevalent. Um, and they're still a problem now for farmers, but it just shows you that once you start messing with the chain, then you get massive problems. And I can again talk about this at length, but I know we're getting late in the day, and I want to end my journey around part of the world by ending on, in a place that I talk about all the time. So please, if you've seen me talk about this before, um, forgive me, but I'm afraid I'll talk about it until I die. And that is the country that is very unlikely for a lot of people to even think about going to, but it's Serbia. Um, I've been going to Serbia now for the last 14 years, leading tours there, but initially when I went to Serbia, I was invited there by the tourism board, and I remember thinking when I was on the plane, I'm not going to like these people, because I was thinking about the atrocities in the 90s and thinking that they would be really horrible. And I remember getting out of the plane and meeting with the men, and they're big, they're shaven-headed, they've got deep voices, but they hug you. The ladies are nice too. Um, <laughs> I was with um, my now Serbian brother, but at the time I didn't know him, Milan Rusic, who's the um, president of the BirdLife Serbia. And he took me, he guided me through Serbia, and we were just going north from Belgrade to the border of Hungary. And we've seen all sorts of things that you'd see in other countries like Romania and Hungary, for example, rollers and, and bee eaters, it was during the summer. But then he saw me hankering, he saw me shaking because I needed to get some urban birding fix. So he took me to a small town on the border of um, Hungary and um, Serbia. We walked into a park that was a wooded park. There were people walking their dogs and holding hands and all that sort of stuff. We stood under a tree, we looked up, and there in a the tree was a long-eared owl. And I thought, wow. You know, I've been living in England all my life. I've only ever seen long-eared owls maybe on four different occasions in my life. And then my Serbian guide, Milan, made an owl call because they're really good at making impressions of animals over there. Brilliant. And the owl looked down. <laughs> but then I looked around and I saw, I was in a rookery, and I saw 22 breeding pairs of long-eared owls. And I'm saying this again, long-eared owls breeding some of them in the open, in wicker baskets, in the open, with about 30 pairs of kestrels, 12 pairs of red-footed falcon, and maybe 100 pairs of rooks. I just collapsed straight away. When I came to, I said, how come there's so many owls? I mean, they were, they were nesting in, as I say, in wicker baskets, or sometimes in nest boxes. And Milan said, well, actually, the farming methods here in Serbia are very similar to the farming methods in Britain, but 200 years ago. So 
when the grain or when the crop was you know, harvested, a lot of the grain was left in the ground. The barns have no walls, so it's rodent heaven here. So at night, the owls feast, and during the day, the uh, rodents are fed upon by um, kestrels. But you also tell me something else quite interesting. So later that year, I brought a group of people who had never seen an owl in their lives in a while before. And I took them to a place in northern Serbia called Kikinda, which is now quite famous, but I'll tell you why. We had dinner in a restaurant. In the evening, we walked around to walk off our dinner in the hotel grounds, and people saw owls. Oh, my God, I've just seen an owl. I said, you ain't seen nothing yet. The following day, we were out in the streets, not in the wilds, but walking the streets of the towns in the vicinity, and there were owls sitting in the trees in the streets. There were owls sitting in parks. There were owls, not in the park, but actually in the trees in the park. If I miss out the word tree, I mean trees. There were owls in the graveyards. There were owls everywhere. I mean, it was incredible just to look around and see these owls. And each owl looked so different. Some were very elongated, some were fat. There was one that had a yellow eye and a red eye, I called him Bowie. <laughs> you know, they were, all, they were even sort of sometimes, you know, hanging out on urban things. I mean, this bird was actually um, flushed because what happens is these birds are roosting in, in these trees and they're used to people, but occasionally someone walks past the tree too closely, what have you, and then the whole tree explodes. So you think there's 10 owls in there, you always have to think double, there's at least 20. It's incredible. In four days, we saw around about 500 owls, 500 long-eared owls. Now, I went to a place called Kikinda, as I said, and Kikinda has a town square, and I walked into the town square, this is 14 years ago, and I looked up, and there was just a bunch of owls looking back at me, Okay. <laughs> They're up in the junipers, so they're not like in Britain where you have them at eye level, they're actually up in the trees. Look, it's like walking into a Harry Potter set, it's just incredible. And I remember, you know, my jaw was dragging on the ground, and people were saying to me, local people were saying to me, what's the matter? They're just, they're just owls. But it was incredible. But anyway, I said, I asked um, my, my guide, Milan, I said, how come, how come we didn't know about this? You know, how come there's no, how come no one's talked about this? And he said, well, basically, um, when we discovered this phenomenon, which was about 20 years ago, our first job was to try and talk to locals to make sure that they didn't kill the owls because a lot of people saw the owl as a bird of doom. So we were trying to say, look, these guys are useful. You know, they can actually cut down the, the, the mice in your farms and your, around your homes, and they're actually cheaper than having spending money on, on pesticides. So to cut a long story short, 12 years or 13 years later, I come back to Kikinda, and firstly, I'm welcomed as a son of Kikinda. My name is David Lindovich when I'm there. <laughs> but the good thing is, now it's a completely different thing. You walk into the town square. Uh, by the way, the record number of owls in the town square was over 800, okay? Imagine that in a town square. A normal town square, a few trees and a couple of shops. Now they sell owl paraphernalia. They sell T-shirts and cups with owls on them. Owls in Serbia are called Sova. They've renamed October, oh, sorry, November, Sovember. <laughs> Kids now are taught throughout the whole of Sovember about owls. They dress up as owls. They do plays talking about owls. They're learning about owls. You go to Kikinda now, people tap you on the shoulder and say, come and see my owls. It's incredible that this has happened in the middle of somewhere. Not in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of an urban area. An urban area which could be any urban area. People often think that you need to go somewhere to see something. You don't. It's right under our noses. It's right above our heads. The government in Serbia have made that park, that, not even a park, that town square, a nature reserve the first of its kind in the world. Isn't that amazing? If you are caught disturbing the owls, you could be fined up to 10,000 euros. That's brilliant. That is brilliant. 
And for me, that is one of the things that makes me so happy about urban birding. The fact that you can find things anywhere. Anything can be anywhere at any time. And that's what you've got to do. Whenever you go anywhere in the future and someone gives you a list of what you can see, take the list, look at it politely, and then when they're not looking, scrunch it up, throw it over your shoulder and back heel it into a bin, do it nicely, back it heel into a bin and say, my mind is open, my heart is open, my soul is open. Don't worry about not recognising or, you know, recognising things. Don't worry about that. It's all about being able to feel and see and enjoy the nature around you. And this is, the, for me, the pinnacle when I go to Serbia, which, by the way, I lead tools there so you can come and see me as well. Hint, hint. <laughs> Um, you know, when I go to Serbia, for me, that epitomises what could be done, okay? So we need to really look at our urban areas very carefully and really try and, you know, develop areas that we can have for nature. So I'd just like to uh, thank you for your time. I know that uh, dinner time's coming and all that sort of stuff. Thank you, Hoss. Thank you, Keith Bitten. Thank you all for allowing me to come tonight. And thank the previous speakers as well. They've been brilliant. It's been a great day. I've been honoured to be part of this. And the fire alarm just punctuated the evening. That's all it did. Thank you very much.